Arthropods are arguably the most successful group of animals to have ever lived, and one need not stray beyond the bounds of their own backyard to get a taste of their astounding variety. Yet all the beauty and glamour, all the weirdness and wonder of the arthropods we see today, is but a tiny slice of what has existed over the course of their half billion year tenure on this planet. And among the denizens of these bygone times were perhaps the largest and most formidable of them all, the Eurypterids. Eurypterids are frequently referred to as sea scorpions, but that is something of a misnomer, for they were neither scorpions nor, as often stated, ancestors of scorpions, instead appearing to be most closely related to horseshoe crabs, which by the way are not crabs. See why I try to avoid using common names? The Eurypterids came in an all manner of shapes and sizes, but there was one group whose members were particularly large and fearsome, the Pterygotids. First arising in the Silurian period and persisting through most of the Devonian, Pterygotids were some of the most successful of all Eurypterids, and were the sole Eurypterid family known to have achieved a worldwide distribution their fossils having been found on every continent except Antarctica. With their streamlined bodies and a broad paddle-shaped telson at the rear, pterygotids would have been agile, proficient swimmers. But their most notable trait, one that sets them apart from any other Eurypterids, was the nature of their chelicerae. Chelicerae are the namesake feature of the arthropod clade Chelicerata, which includes not only Eurypterids and horseshoe crabs, but spiders, scorpions, and other arachnids. The Chelicerae are the foremost pair of appendages, and the only set of appendages located in front of the mouth. They vary in form from the powerful pincer-like Chelicerae of solifuges to the venomous fangs of spiders, but all serve to function as mouth parts used in feeding. In most Eurypterids, the Chelicerae were relatively small, but the Chelicerae of Pterygotids were greatly elongated, forming enormous grasping pincers with well-developed tooth-like structures called denticles lining their inner edges. The biggest of all the Pterygotids, indeed perhaps the biggest arthropod known to have ever existed, was initially described as Pterygotus renaniae, though it was later moved to the genus Eucalopterus. Eucalopterus renaniae was first discovered in Germany in the year 1914. Germany indeed seems to be something of a hotbed for big prehistoric creepy crawlies, having also been the site of discovery for the gigantic carboniferous millipede Arthroplera. The immense size of Eucalopterus is evidenced by a highly fragmentary, albeit very detailed and rather haunting fossil. It consists of the two most distal podomeres on the animal's chelicera, with distal meaning furthest from the animal's body. Podomeres are the individual segments of an arthropod limb, and in this particular fossil, the two podomeres preserved were the fixed ramus and free ramus which together form the impressive pincers at the end of the chelicerae. The fixed ramus, which is the longer of the two podomeres preserved, measured around 36 centimetres, but was only three quarters complete, suggesting a full length of around 45 centimetres. Scaling this fossil in accordance to the body proportions of more complete pterygoted specimens, indicates that the entire animal would have been approximately two and a half metres long. And that's not including the chelicerae, which, when fully extended, would have added another metre or so to its length. One minor caveat is that this estimate operates under the assumption that there was no size allometry in pterygoted chelicerae, meaning that the proportion of the chelicerae relative to the Eurypterids' overall size was assumed to have remained constant as the animal grew. But even with this slight ambiguity, it was clear that Eucalopterus could reach some truly impressive dimensions, and would have been an absolute sight to behold when it was alive, especially for an arthropod fanatic like 
yours truly. I just know that I'd try to pet it, even if it cost me my hand, or worse. The classification of Eucalyptus relative to the rest of the Pterygotids has historically been the subject of a little bit of confusion, but more recent findings have since helped elucidate this huge arthropod's taxonomy. Eucalyptus was once regarded as the most basal of the Pterygotids, meaning its lineage was the earliest to diverge, and consequently the most distantly related to the rest of the group. This was based off the impression that, unlike the rest of the Pterygotids, which possessed undivided genital appendages, the genital appendages of Eucalyptus were thought to be divided into three segments. This is a feature shared with non-Pterygotid Eurypterids like Slimonia, suggesting it represented an ancestral or plesiomorphic trait that must have evolved before the emergence of the Pterygotids with undivided genital appendages being a more derived trait that evolved after Eucalyptus was proposed to have diverged from the rest of the Pterygotids. Eucalyptus was even, at one point, classified as part of a separate family, the Eucalyptoridae. However, paleontologists have since examined this giant arthropod's genitals more thoroughly. Ah, what a job that must be and found that the adult playtime appendages of Eucalyptus were undivided, just like the rest of the Pterygotids. And phylogenetic analyses have since indicated the opposite of what was originally believed, that Eucalyptus was, in fact, one of the most recently diverged members of the Pterygotidae. This lines up well with the chronology of Pterygotids, for Eucalyptus, with all known remains dating to the Devonian period, appeared relatively recently in the fossil record. It also fits in with a consistent trend of pterygotids becoming progressively larger in size over the course of their evolution, with more basal members of the group such as Ceocopterus being relatively small, and giants like Acutoramus, Pterygotus, and of course Eucalyptus itself appearing later on. Thus, the Pterygotids can be regarded as a prime example of Cope's Rule, which postulates that organisms within an evolving lineage will develop larger body sizes over time, though Cope's Rule is by no means universal. So that's about it for the taxonomy talk. Bottom line is, all of that confusion could have been avoided if someone had been a little more attentive with their examination of a giant extinct arthropod's wedding vegetables, and having now said that, I feel like quitting YouTube. But in the meantime, let's talk about how Eucalyptus could have lived. I think it's fair to say that you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that Eucalyptus was a predator and a fearsome one at that. But if we want to make some more specific deductions about its lifestyle, then we will need to take a closer look at certain aspects of the animal's anatomy. Good senses are of paramount importance for any predator, and a cursory glance at the head of Eucalyptus, with its enormous compound eyes, makes it pretty clear that vision was one of this Eurypterid's principal means of perceiving the world around it. One study estimated the visual acuity of Eucalyptus and a handful of other Eurypterid genera based on two key parameters, the number of lenses in each eye and the interomitidial angle. Okay, I'm definitely going to have to elaborate on that second one, aren't I? Omatidia are the individual lenses that form a compound eye, and the interomatidial angle is the angle between two adjacent omatidia. Among modern arthropods, the interomatidial angle is considered a reliable indicator of the animal's ecology, namely in discerning active, mobile predators, for which the value tends to be low. Eucalyptus, along with the closely related Pterygotus, were both found to have a high number of lenses and a low interomatidial angle, indicative of their status as active, high-level predators. And a subsequent study, including additional factors such as lens diameter and eye area, reinforced these conclusions. Sensors are one thing a predator needs, 
But once you've detected your prey, you've got to subdue it. And for that, ample weaponry is a must. And in Eucalopterus, the animal's principal weapons couldn't be more obvious. These fearsome chelicerae were not only huge and wickedly spiked, but robust and heavily reinforced with a thick cuticle, and the free ramus was noticeably curved. All these characteristics point to strong grasping and piercing capabilities, and would have allowed Eucalopterus to restrain struggling prey while simultaneously inflicting deep puncture wounds. So the nature of the eyes and claws imply Eucalopterus was an active apex predator. But how does the animal's mobility line up with this proposed lifestyle? Eucalopterus had an elongated, streamlined body, and with both the telson and rearmost pair of limbs modified into flattened paddles, it's clear that the animal was a swimmer. But how exactly did it swim? Common sense would probably suggest that the arthropod's broad, flattened telson acted akin to a tail fin, propelling the animal forward by means of vertical undulation as seen in modern whales. But contrary to what the many Dunning-Kruger University graduates frequenting internet comment sections would desire to believe, common sense isn't exactly the magnum opus of human reasoning especially in the extremely nuanced and complex field of paleontology. Analysis of terry-goated fossils indicates that, while the telson itself appears to have been quite mobile, their bodies as a whole had rather limited flexibility on the vertical axis, which isn't exactly conducive to the swimming technique mentioned above, though they did show evidence of considerably greater flexibility on the horizontal axis. It is, perhaps, more likely that it was the flattened rear limbs that served as the animal's principal source of propulsion, with the telson instead acting as a rudder, a function for which its physical form was found to be much better suited. The telson's role as an effective rudder, combined with the horizontal flexibility of Eurypterids evident from fossil remains, jointly suggest that Eucalopterus, while not an especially fast swimmer, was very agile and manoeuvrable, and would have certainly been a force to be reckoned with in its ecosystem. But what ecosystem are we talking about here? When you hear the name Sea Scorpion, you of course think of the sea, but in addition to the scorpion part of that name being a crock of rubbish, the same could indeed apply to the sea part, at least in the case of Eucalopterus. Eurypterids occupied a broad range of habitats, and many most definitely did live in the sea. But there's compelling evidence that Eucalopterus was not among them. A fossil site in the Rhenish Slate Mountains of Germany, in which the remains of Eucalopterus as well as a couple other Eurypterids have been unearthed, displayed a conspicuous absence of certain organisms that one would expect to find preserved in marine deposits. The paleo-environment of the Rhenish Slate Mountains is instead interpreted to represent a shallow, brackish, or even freshwater setting. So, in essence, while often depicted as a terror of the seas, Eucalopterus was, in fact, a river monster and such a habitat would appear to correlate with the inferred swimming capabilities of the animal. In a shallow riverine or estuarine environment, manoeuvrability would plausibly be more favourable for a large predator than straightforward swimming speed. Eucalopterus and the pterygotids as a whole were extraordinarily successful animals, but nevertheless their reign did eventually come to an end. But what could have brought about their demise? Well, as far as I can tell, there is no clear-cut consensus on what may have caused their eventual extinction. But there is still one explanation that I'd like to discuss either way. Perhaps the most mainstream proposal is that they were ousted from their spot at the top of the food chain by jawed fish like placoderms, which were becoming increasingly large and powerful around this time. The Devonian isn't called the Great Age of the Fishes for nothing. I can certainly understand the allure of this explanation. 
It's simple, seems to make sense, and there's an appealing underdog narrative in which the once small and defenceless vertebrates triumph over those horrid, creepy arthropods. AKA the first half of Walking with Monsters in a nutshell. But when one delves a little deeper, the tale of the fish's triumph over the Eurypterids starts to reveal its flaws. If it were true, we would expect the fossil record to show a progressive decline in Eurypterids, accompanied by a corresponding increase in the diversity of fish. But when comparing trends in fish and Eurypterid diversity over time, there was no compelling evidence to suggest that one group usurped the other. For example, both Eurypterids and fishes appear to have suffered declines during the mid-Devonian, recovered towards a peak in the late Devonian, then concurrently declined once again towards the Permian. A more detailed analysis of the co-occurrence of vertebrates and Eurypterids also failed to find any meaningful evidence of a correlation between the diversity of fishes and the extinction of the pterygotids. So here we have yet another example of an out-competition narrative failing to stand the test of time. I guess I should just be relieved that life on our planet never featured pterygotids, cause we all know how that show would have handled the topic of their extinction. And with that, we come to the end of this video. If you'd like to learn about another supersized prehistoric arthropod, then feel free to check out this video about the gigantic carboniferous millipede Arthroplera. And of course, if you are curious about any of the information I've presented here, then the references are linked in the description for your perusal. And if you enjoy my content, then feel free to subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments section below. Thank you all very much for watching, and I shall see you again very soon.